Okay, I just changed the title to Isaiah 23 that we just did. This is chapter 24. It's uh, God's servant, uh, righteous servant, Moshiach versus Israel in Isaiah 53. And the parentheses did read guilt offer, close parentheses. I've changed that to Tobias guilt offer, in parentheses. Uh, he's the only one that, does, uh, that says it's a guilt offering. It's used for Judaism. Chapter 24, total different commentary on 53. It's based on world exaltation of the Jewish people, which has never occurred. So today, 53 can't be Israel. And I will tell you, and I have told you, it never will occur. You're not going to get two billion Christians to disavow Jesus. You're not going to get two billion Muslims to disavow Allah as they know him. And they're not going to take off from their mosque the last messenger and prophet of God, even though it's not true. I am the last messenger and prophet of God, God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53, Moshiach. Why these two didn't just keep, keep with what the, the, the Talmud did? Even the Rambam, they said, they said, it's a personal Messiah, this Isaiah 53 describes. He is the man of Isaiah 11. And he's, they just knew you got to have a description. And the only description out there is 53, which really has nothing to do with King David. So they didn't assume Moshiach was going to be just like King David or anything. He's going to be this, this uh, person that the Christians call suffering servant. Well, that's not what he is. He's the right... What's going on? I don't know, my picture keeps flickering. Uh, oh, you think it's a automatic uh, focus thing? Well, it didn't blur, it just flickered. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, well, let's just get into it. Again, this is the book. I'm reading from the book God Dictated to Me. After he taught me the materials, Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, just as he dictated uh, the Torah to Moses. And just like Moses, who could have no idea about Genesis and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, Exodus, um, well, I guess it depends on when he wrote it, he could have known Exodus, but uh, I couldn't know the information in this book. No rabbi today knows these things. That's what the book's about. Look at the things y'all missed. Look at where you dropped the ball. And here's the things you simply don't know. How? An atheist for 50 years. No religious friends. No religious background. An atheist for 50 years. And a Gentile from Texas. It doesn't make me a cowboy, by the way. I grew up in Houston in the city. But uh, I did get shot through the abdomen on a ranch, so that's Texas for you. The belief that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as one man Israel that is often attributed to Rashi is now the prevalent teaching on the subject. Jews for Judaism is one of the most followed on the internet in its analysis of Isaiah 53 being the people of Israel. I, I don't know, you know, Toby has got 66,000 followers. I would think Jews for Judaism has more. Is it because they're international? The following is from Jews for Judaism, Isaiah 53, verse by verse. You can find this on their website. You can download it, as a matter of fact, if you want to see the whole thing. I'm hitting about three of their verses. 
quote, which they do not have. Okay, but my book shows it, but it doesn't close at the end of 52.13. It closes at the end of 15. They don't have it. And this is from the JPS 1985 version, uh, uh, translation of Hebrew to English, from scratch, from the Leningrad Codex, the oldest Hebrew Bible in existence. 52.13, Behold, my servant shall succeed. He will be exalted and become high and exceedingly lawfully. This is, uh, this is the commentary of Jews for Judaism. The success and exaltation of God's servant. It doesn't say righteous or servant is an event that the prophet sees as futuristic. The immediate context, 52, 7 through 12, tells us that this is part of the blessing that Israel will experience at the time of the restoration. Couldn't be more wrong. Oh, I'm going to have my commentary on this. It comes up next. Couldn't be more wrong. I think this fellow's last name is Kravitz with a K. I've been saying Michael Scoback, but that's going to change the Kravitz. My response to the commentary of Jews for Judaism on Isaiah 53, 13. In Isaiah 52, 13 through 15, a multiple verse quotation, the Lord begins to describe his righteous servant of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 52, 13 through 15 should have been verses 1 through 3 of chapter 53. My servant to be exalted and become high and exceedingly lofty because of these quotes and because of the words themselves is now the Gentile man that comes God comes with from Adam, a Christian country and of the Jewish people none are with him. It is not the exiles. It is the gentle that becomes my righteous servant in Isaiah 53, 11, after passing, passing the test of devotion. In Isaiah 53, 10, when he makes himself an offering for guilt in the covenant with God. The immediate context of Isaiah 52, 7 through 12, okay, before you get to the quotes, 13, 15, is poetry and an announcement of prophecy fulfilled in the return to Judah of all 13 tribes who had all been deported in exile to uh, Assyria and Babylon at one time or another. That, that's what 52 is about until you get to 53, which is verses 13 through 15. The exalted has nothing to do with the servant the Jewish people. My servant, exalted, was the Assyrian Babylon exiles and the victory in sight of all the nations was the second temple. It was not a futuristic prophecy. The return included God's forgiveness of all the sins and inequities of the Assyrian Babylon exiles. Jeremiah's time to come of the new covenant with sin forgiveness in the day of the Lord is for the Roman dispersal, the diaspora, and is futuristic. The translation of our scroll in Shabbat of Isaiah 52 that, Rashi's com that Rashi comments on does not include the quotations that combine verses 13 through 15. The translation used by Jews for Judaism for its commentary also does not have the quotations. They are the only verse quotations of Isaiah 52 in a demarcation of the verses of the fulfillment of prophecy by the return of the remnant of the 13 tribes from exile. They are the beginning of the description of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 and have nothing to do with the exiles. 
God's servant, the Jewish people. God's righteous servant is a Gentile in the beginning. The translation of the Jewish Publication Society has the quotations, 1985 versions. I don't know that they have it in the earlier versions, but they started with scratch in 55 for the 85 version, 30 years with uh, starting from scratch, Codex, uh, the oldest Hebrew Bible, the Leningrad Codex, from scratch. If it doesn't have the quotes, it's not from scratch. It was either um, went from Hebrew to Greek to English, and they actually had uh, rabbis who tried to clarify the Hebrew in a lot of Bibles. But this is from scratch. This is 1985. God says there's no better translation that you can find. Thirteen, behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and he shall be very high. That's me. That's not, that's not all of the Jewish people gathered as one man Israel. It's the beginning of 53, God's righteous servant. He never calls the Jewish people his righteous servant. He does call them his servant, and they are. But 53 is very specific about it. It stands out on its own. It describes a different person. And in this case, a Gentile. Again, God's coming from Adam, chapter 63, and other Jewish people, none are with him. But he's coming with his representation, as we see, uh, well, in other chapters. It's Moshe. God's righteous servant, Moshe. 14. Just as the many were appalled at him, so marred was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. 15. Just so, he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them. <laughs> Nobody has any idea that this is what it was going to be like when Moshe came. <coughs> Neither did Moshe. That's me. And the righteous servant. Kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them. Should behold what they never have heard. My servant of, of number of 13 it's not the Jewish people, it's not Israel, is now the Gentile and not the exiles who becomes my righteous servant in Isaiah 53, 11, after pass, passing the test of devotion in Isaiah 53, 10. Will he offer himself for guilt that he might receive a long life? It's kind of like the binding of Isaac. When he makes himself an offering for guilt in a covenant with God, Isaiah 53 then begins with a new multiple verse quotation. This is after 15, 13, 14, and 15. It's verses 1 through 6 are combined. The people who say, who can believe what we have heard? Okay, behold what you can see here. It's that kind of wording. They are combined. It's the same people who say he was wounded for our sins. Our guilt was laid upon him. And all those other words that start, it's basically four, five, and six. Those are the many to be made righteous. That's their problem. They're not righteous. They don't follow God's laws, rules, and commandments. And what's the story about? A man, a lowly man, rising high. Rising high. Uh, I'll get to it. And uh, making the many righteous with his knowledge in long life. That's the, that's the many. That's what the story is about. You start out with those who need a, somebody to teach them and draw them back to Judaism. And the rest of the story is about just that. Let's describe him 
disease. The man of Saul is familiar with disease, crushed with disease, exposed to death but given long life, many other things. We'll get to So Isaiah 53 then begins with a new multiple verse quotation that is missing the quotes from the translation of Artsko, scroll, Shabbat, and also Jews for Judaism in the translation used in his commentary, but included in the translation of the Jewish Publication Society. Who would, this is uh, 53, 1 through 6. Who would believe our report? And to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? And he came up like a sapling before it, and like a root from dry ground. He had neither form nor comeliness. And we saw him that he had no appearance. Now shall we desire him? Despised and rejected by men, a man of pains and accustomed to illness, and as one who hides his face from us, despised, and we held him of no account. Indeed, he bore our illnesses. This is verse 4. And our pains, he carried them. Yet we accounted him as plague smitten by God and oppressed. But he was pained because of our transgressions, crushed because of our inequities. The chastisement of our welfare was upon him. And with his wound, we were healed. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he would not open his mouth. Like a lamb to the slaughter, he would be brought, and like an ewe that is mute before her shears, and he would not open his mouth. Oh. That wasn't the JPS version of 1 through 6, but it's close enough. The speaker is no longer God from the Isaiah 52 multiple verse quote, but is the witnesses of God's righteous servant of the Isaiah 53 multiple quote verse that follows. The witnesses who are Jews, identify themselves as one of the many made righteous by God's righteous servant, saying, It was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering he endured. That's verse 4. He was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our inequities. Verse 5. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. Verse 5. And... The Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. See also verse uh, 6. Oh no, that's verse 6. And see offering for guilt in 5310. I got to get the TV. My parents are in their knives. They can't hear you. I got to go to, shut their door. <clears throat> the quotes beginning at verse 1 and ending before verse 7 at the end of 6 identify the speaker verses 1 and 2 as also being witnesses made righteous by the righteous servant from the suffering he endured God's teachings is that no man bears the suffering of others. It is not even possible to bear the sins, wounds, chastisement, bruising, sickness, and suffering of other people. I don't even know what that would mean. No one or others can be healed or atoned for because another man or men suffer or are beaten or murdered or sacrificed. So what are these verses by the witnesses about? The sickness of the witnesses is not being righteous. God's righteous servant suffers by the chastisement, punishment, bruising, crushing, and maltreatment laid on him by the words and power of God to make him suitable for his purpose that might prosper. 
a purpose that includes the righteous servant making the many righteous by his knowledge with long life and the building of the third temple. The righteous servant bearing up to this fire of refinement. And God left it out of 53 on purpose. You can find it in Ezekiel. That's the backup for all this. It's like, well, he didn't, he wanted, it's my second proof. My third proof. That I can explain it. Nobody has ever seen this before. You're hearing it from the righteous servant Moshiach, who is also, because there's only one description and four righteous servants to come. The prophet like Moses, Elijah, and of course Moshiach, and the man described in Isaiah 53. That's my, that's my life it's talking about. That's why God dictated to me the life of God's righteous servant, Moshiach. That, yeah, God's my autobiographer. <laughs> I didn't have to learn the material, I remembered. And it's really just, it's, it's a very short book. And it's, it's there just to show injuries uh, and all the other things that happened to this man. According to 53, afflicted, grievous bodily wounds. This is the commentary of Jews for Judaism on verse 53, 4, 5, and 10. And it's Jews for Judaism, Isaiah 53, verse by verse, which you can find on their uh, website followed by my commentary and response. Jews for Judaism, commentary on Isaiah 53, 4. But in truth, this is their version. But in truth, it was our ills that he bore and our pains that he carried. But we had regarded him diseased, stricken by God and afflicted. The kings now realize that's their version of 53.4. The kings now realize that their spiritual assessment of the servant, servant were completely backward. The kings did. They'd be the leaders of all the nations of the world. During the time of the servant's lowliness, and this was written in antiquity. Okay, now the exiles definitely hit a low point. But Assyria defeating the northern kingdom, Babylon defeating the south kingdom, Judah. That's what the world was back then. You know, you had numbers you went and took from other people. Yeah, that included your property, your house. Eat your crops. Dog eat dog. So these kings, I, I don't know when they realize this. this is this present tense? Or is this some future thing that's going to happen? Well, I would say the biggest low is the Holocaust. During the time of the servant's lowliness, those who knew him believed that his constant affliction proves that he is spiritually deformed. Otherwise, why would this nation be singled out for God's wrath over any other? I don't know. Go ask the Armenians. Well, maybe so. Maybe the Holocaust puts you at the top of the level. But they didn't make you the only people. Most of them don't exist anymore. You're still here. Jewish people. Israel. But now, with the servant's exaltation, when? When? It's an event that cannot occur. No, two billion Christians aren't going to disavow Jesus and say the Jewish people have been right all along. It's the God of Israel. Two billion Muslims aren't going to do that either. The world is not going to exalt the Jewish people. And God makes that clear in the covenant of friendships. He simply says you'll be safe on your soul and you will no longer be the taunts of nations when I place my temple amongst you. Not be the taunts of nations. Does that sound like kings bowing down of the nations of the earth and exalting the Jewish people? Everything in this commentary is based on that happening. 
or has happened. That, well, they don't do that on something that's never going to happen. The entire comedy, you got to throw it out. 53 is not Israel, period. And you know, if you read uh, the previous chapter, 23, you know all the different reasons it simply cannot apply to them as one man Israel, the Jewish people. But now, with the servant's exaltation, as though it's happened. Look at this. That's fraudulent. They realized that the servant was not more wicked than them, but more righteous. Now, this guy can tell the future. He's going to see that. They realized. The kings of the nations realized. The leaders in China, North Korea, South Korea, they're going to realize this as they exalt the Jew. World exaltation, they call it. But now, with the servant's exaltation, they realize that the servant was not more wicked than them, but more righteous. Oh, really? That's going to be an interesting time. Their assessment of the servant is reversed, because they come to a true understanding of God's plan throughout history. Does that sound like the Christians to you? How about the Muslims? How about Islam? A true understanding of God's will throughout history. Yeah, I don't think so. With the restoration of Israel and God's glory coming to dwell in the Jerusalem temple, the nations of the world will experience true sanctity and a real connection to God. God says, coming into friendship, the nations will know God sanctifies Israel. That's what he says. But let's don't teach God's words by any stretch of the imagination. And of course, this is why all rabbis have been dismissed before God. And that's in the Hebrew Bible. That's God's words. I wouldn't teach anything else. They will realize, I guess we're still talking about the king, or the nations, they will realize that many of their activities were actively preventing God's presence from being manifested in this world, even though they had considered many of these activities to be righteous and godly. Uh, how about not building the third temple? Who's keeping him away? Well, that's his purpose. Malachi 3, I'm going to return to my temple. Well, why haven't you built it? And if you're the righteous servant of God, Jewish people, where is it? Why aren't you making people righteous with a new covenant of sin forgiveness? Because I wonder why they didn't just stay with the Talmud. Isaiah 50, uh, 11 describes the anointed one, Moshe. And that's just because the Spirit entered him. That's why he's anointed. Uh, it's like the oil you give in a, a physical human uh, anointment. And described in 53. Moshe asked the man described in 53. That's what Rambam said in many, many, many other rabbis and sages. Why change it now? Now, I know they'll say Rashi did that, but there's a problem with that. He mentions the personal Messiah in Zechariah. His preamble. That does work. And put it out. I know it has to refocus. Um, anyway, I don't know where I was. In order for God's presence to be revealed in this world, there needs to be obedience and humility towards God. The obedience does not have to be perfect. Because God doesn't demand from his creation that which they cannot deliver. But it needs to be accepting of God's sovereignty to the degree that humans are capable. He's saying we've got to stop sinning to the extent we can. What do we know? God comes with a covenant of sin forgiveness. Not worried about that. No. All it is is God 